हरियो हरियो हेलो माय फ्रेंड्स there is something so utterly unaffected in everyone no matter what is happening it's there unaffected unattached unconcerned outside it may be stormy maybe crazy or kinds of things may go on there is always that haven we can come back home to that when friend wrote me how she is waking up often in panic and externally trying to find somehow a place to fit in go to do with her time with her life and finds a lot of rejection enmity and is getting often totally confused by that again changing place hoping <laughs> it's going to be better that stability she is looking for is not being found in the circumstances of course there are circumstances that make it easier to let go and to connect but it's not that we find stability in the circumstances that stability one is looking for is here is now is in ourselves we can become like a rock immovable in a river and the waters of destiny are just flowing around no matter how strong the water is that rock is simply there here now in ourselves there is that balance that clarity that stability we can try and try and try to find it or to create it in the circumstances but most likely it's going to be disturbed by one thing or another <laughs> usually there are always a few things that keep on nagging and disturbing you are here for that you are here to become strong to learn not to get sucked into the river or whatever is happening i wrote to my friend it's not surprising the world is crazy at the moment there is so much uncertainty so much fear so much confusion and the pull is very strong to join that current but we need not do so no matter where we are no matter who we are <laughs> no matter what kind of role we are playing in this movie there is always that essential beingness immovable the only way to find that peace that stability we are looking for is to learn to connect with that consciousness that is the job 
that matters most. To increase that conscious experience of presence. That is what we are here for. That's how we are growing in experience. Essentially immovable, growing in experience. And all the practices help us. It's not that with the practice we can create it. It's not that with the practice we can somehow finally find it. The practice helps us to become more conscious. It helps us to bring the attention more to the present experience and becoming more aware of what's going on in the present how we are prone to be pushed left and right by the influences that are there, that come from the current of events, that come from the world, so-called outside, but also from the influences that bubble, bubble up from our own unconscious. When we become aware how much we are influenced by that, then we can start to work on it, catch from that, to redirect the attention back to the source. That is the purpose of practice. Not to create that stability, it's there. But to become aware, it's there. If you are not disturbing it, And then learn to make that experience stronger and stronger. Mariana writes me, how can we combine, join, when we are praying to the Guru or worshipping the Guru Join the inner guru, that it's opening up, that that grace flows from the inner guru and how to stay there all the time. Now to the first part of that question, Mariano, it happens all by itself. If one sincerely connects with an outer guru, automatically one concept connects with the inner guru, whether you are consciously aware of that or not, that is happening. Because in the guru, we are not worshipping a person, but we are connecting with that essential beingness that is clearer manifested in the guru than in the disciple, usually, sure. <laughs> And that essential beingness is our own inner guru. So it's not that we have to somehow find a trick how to join the two. Whether you are focusing more on the inner guru or whether you are focusing on an outer guru, you are connecting with the same. So both aspects are anyhow involved, so you don't have to try, try to find a way. Now for the second part of the question, how not to lose it? Well, that is our job. That is what I meant, what practice is for. I cannot give you a magic trick that you can just bring the attention into that and then stay there. The old habits, the old vasanas will always pull the attention away again. And the magic trick is sincerely bringing the attention back with persistence and with patience. That is the magic of it. It 
it happens very, very rarely that somebody consciously connects with that and then simply rests rooted in that. There may be a few exceptions, but for almost all of us, there will be a period for some shorter, for some longer, a period where we are trying and sometimes it happens while we are trying, sometimes it happens while we are not trying, but if we keep on consciously attempting to bring the attention back to that stability, to that essential beingness that is the inner guru, that is, that is manifested by the outer guru, that is God, The more we bring the attention sincerely back to that, the more often it happens that simply you become aware, you are connected. And for those who have the patience and persevere, it's getting easier and easier and eventually the moment may come that your attention is diving so deep into that that you simply don't lose it anymore. How can we, <laughs> what can we do to not lose it? <laughs> Just bring it back whenever you become aware that the attention has wandered off everywhere else except being consciously connected with that essence, with that which matters, and bring it back again and again until it sticks. Okay. I leave the subject and I'm asking you, my friends, is there anyone here who would like to come in? You're welcome to do so. And now we are 15 people. Is there anyone who would like to talk already? You're welcome. Hi. Hello, Leora. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Yes, courageously for, for as change. usual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you spoke about concentration and um, bringing back the attention. Um, so there are many aspects, I would say, because what I feel is there's this um, thing that happens when there are like um, different voices, like um, things are going on in the head, reactions to what is going on and what should I say, what I shouldn't say, or yeah, reactions, I would say. So then um, I notice that it's all uh, reactivity, actually. What they call, like when they, they teach in the Vipassana, they talk about reactivity. And then I can, I, once I notice it, it's reactivity, then I can say, okay, not interesting. So I just let go and uh, I just don't react upon the reactivity, react yes. like, yeah. yeah. Um, and there, okay, I'll tell, I'll tell what happened on the demonstration last week. Uh, on the way there, it was difficult with the family I drove, the friends and, and their daughter, and it was intense between them. And uh, we were late, it took a long time, the roads were full and uh, yeah. So, um, and we couldn't find parking, Tel Aviv was blocked. Okay. 
finally, we got there happy ever after. And we saw there were many, many, many people, specifically last Saturday because of what was happening before and the week before. So that like brought the energies up and everybody was uh, sort of happy. <laughs> And we didn't go into where all the people were standing. We found a place to sit in a small cafe. And just like from there, we could feel. The energy was very, very strong, very united, and very powerful. Um, which was perfect. I mean, this was, of course, the aim of the whole thing. But for me, it's um, it actually threatens my nervous system with the lights and the music and yeah. So I don't go every week, of course, but this specific time was really, really intense. So I've learned my my nervous system actually it happens by itself to so I don't know what I do there. I don't concentrate, I don't push, I don't hide. Or maybe this is called concentration, like something in me becomes really, really stable. Because if I don't do that, I would also I'm under the danger of disconnecting in a in a bad way, in a yeah. very unpleasant um, disconnect. So uh, my friend took a photo of me, and when I saw the photo, I said, "Yeah, fine." I think it, it gave me a reflection of that, you know, that I was okay. It was. Because I, yeah, I, I could see on, on the photo. So maybe this is what you're talking about, um, actually. Um, this kind of... Um, realizing what is happening and then like this tragedy that tra uh, yeah, that already is in my system somehow that I can use to bring the attention <laughs> to something in me that is that is stable actually something that I don't know what it is but maybe it's what you're talking about really yes sure that's the good direction <laughs> And uh, yeah. you said uh, there is such an intensity there sometimes that it's a bit too much for your nervous system. And then you don't externally participate in much, but if you are then managing not to get overwhelmed and to relax in spite of the tension that it creates in your nervous system and do exactly what you have said, simply be there, in intensely alert and relaxed, then actually you are participating in a great way because you're bringing something very strong in the current. It's You are the first to benefit from it, but it's also radiating and the whole event, the whole demonstration current and all the people around you, they also will benefit. So by all means, continue in that way. Yeah. So then I wanted to ask something as um, connected. Um, a fa family member from Norway who never comes to Israel. And actually, when we used to go to Norway, Sama, we never really um, got closer to her spending time together. And she, her life now is sort of messy. And she called me. Mm. And she said she has been feeling energies. So I was very kind to her, and uh, I said, yeah, some people do. And 
But then she said she wanted to, to see me and to heal me, to give me energy, healing energy. Yeah. So then I told her, listen, I also have, I'm also very sensitive and uh, I can feel energies, but I don't do anything about it. I live with it, but I never let anybody heal me with energies. I never do that. And then we spoke about getting together also with my ex-husband and my children and it, somehow it didn't work out and she put pressure on me. And I already realized that she was a bit um, oh, <laughs> center, <Yeah. laughs> I would say. Yeah. She's going through a very difficult time. Yeah. And I felt slightly aggression also. I mean, somehow I felt she should have understood already that we are not going to meet this time. I mean, we're not going to go to Tel Aviv. It was getting complicated. And she kept putting pressure on me through the WhatsApp. Yeah. So I was going through, you know, how, how to tell her. I, I really felt sort of uh, sorry for her, really. I wanted to be nice to her. But also there was, so, you know, like, not aggression, but like, okay, don't you understand? Should I really say it really that clear? Or should I lie? Find excuses? or But I, and I, I didn't want to find excuses. I just wanted to be clear and so then I just had to write no I'm sorry <sighs> um I felt okay doing that but I just feel yeah that maybe I'm sure she was hurt she was sorry she was definitely sorry but I think it's the best way, really. Well, you have to know. Every situation is unique, and sometimes it's good, uh, even if we have to push ourselves to connect in spite of that, and sometimes it's also the right thing to do. No, let's not connect this time. So, actually, you have a question with that, or you, you are not quite... quite aware whether you did the writing or not. I think I did the right thing. I just um, hoped, hoped that she would understand without having to go back and forth and uh, at the end just say, no, sorry. Like really, like, like you. Like you talk to a little child sometimes when they nag you about something. So it's it's just like, yeah, maybe it's not really a question. I think I did the right thing, but. Right. Uh, right now, I can tell you, communication is not easy. It's worse, <laughs> yeah. it's worse than usual. Uh, people, communication was never very easy. People would think they communicate and actually uh, each one is talking about their own stuff. Uh, they, they are not quite aware how little communication is really going on, but right now it's extreme. People are being like in clouds and not sub, there is no subtlety, uh, very little subtlety to really understand what others say and really communicate, it always goes somehow off. It's really some a phenomena that is simply there. So don't expect people yeah. to react in, in ways that you would like them to react because most likely they don't now. And then you have to find your way and do as you did, that which you feel is the best way to deal with the situation. So you say it's a, um, yeah, that, that makes sense. You say it's connected with the situation, how you 
described it in the beginning of your talking today yes. and, and almost every time you you speak actually. There's a lot of confusion and it's simply an experience. Suda also she communicates with people and is totally surprised by the re responses and seeing that they haven't gotten a clue of what she has been talking about. Seeing that they haven't got a, a clue, you said. Okay, yeah, okay. That, that they haven't yeah. understood and reply something totally different. And uh, yeah. it's like the communication that was always difficult has become more difficult. So it's better to accept that people do not uh, react when you give subtle pointers the way you would hope they would react. Accept that it is simply most of the time a fact now. And then you deal with the situation that you feel you are okay with it. And then that is the right way. If we can, thank you. If we can without hurting anyone, so much the better. But sometimes people have strong expectations which we cannot fulfill, and then they feel a bit hurt. But it's not that you are hurting them. And then we can deal with them as diplomatic as it's possible, but sometimes it's also good to say no. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's very important uh, for me to hear, as I have realized that I'm. Yeah, that I have become so much more clear when I speak to people, and yeah, I also have this with my sister. She's like all over the place. We speak on the phone. Yeah. So. To be very clear when I communicate, very clear, not to say too much. Yeah. Just what's needed because, yeah, there is like pressure altogether. There is a pressure, there is a, like me. a cloud that clouds people's minds. And so simply don't expect uh, if in spite of that subtle communication happens Wonderful, so much the better. But uh, don't expect people to suddenly pick up clues that uh, they they can uh, react to what you are indicating the way you would like them to. Yeah, thank you, Werner. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shall we leave it at that? Yeah. Home. <laughs> okay. Ah, hello, Mariam. You have to unmute, Mariam. I can't hear you. Okay, now, now it's working? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Now. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Verona. <laughs> hello. Hi. Yeah, I think that um, the topics you already touched so today uh, are leading into the direction where goes my questions uh -huh. mm, because you're talking a lot about I mean we often talk about that the circumstances we are in the times we are in the confusion and the fear that is around and of course it's it's in my job as a psychiatrist and as a psychotherapist very often that I have to deal with a lot of this confusion and this fear yeah. and so for me always it's very good. yeah yeah it's very good to to connect again to the source and, and prepare myself when i go to the job but this week uh, i felt like i was challenged in a very special way in that uh, field because i have a 15 year old girl that is coming to me since i think march and um i i knew already she's really in a really deep chaotic state sometimes and also out of control and uh, what happened last week was she was uh, coming to me and um, two days after she had to kill her cat, the family cat, in a very cruel way. And so I was dealing with that from the weekend on in emails and she went to the hospital and I had to talk to the people around her and the family. And, and then she came also to me again to see me. And what is 
coming up after I met her again and we were talking about it and she didn't feel any regret about it that I wanted to ask you also I talked with two friends and with a colleague about it and I wanted to ask you what you think that um, is happening when someone is killing someone or killing a pet or an animal something that is close to to them uh, I thought about also if it's like these dark energies we sometimes talk about and it's um um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe just you know, like really, she's lost a way out of out in in her life in a way. And I, because usually I connect with the people who come to me and try to understand. And you know, but I feel in this case it's important for me to not connect so deeply. So I, my question is, what do you think about when is happening something like this? It has to do with the dark energy sometimes you talk about, and how to deal with it. Or yeah, that that is my question. Mm -hmm. I mean, all actions that are not connected with the light have to do with the dark energy. Not only now, but that was <laughs> all the time like this. Right now, it's very strong. The energies are very strong. And if you are opening up, it comes in very strongly. And so especially somebody who is already unbalanced can be easily subject them to be overwhelmed and to idiotic actions that they wouldn't do normally. Now, should you not connect so strong? You can connect, but at the same time, when you connect, connect with yourself and connect with that immovable aspect of yourself that they have been talking about. And even if you, in the session while talking to her, you lose it, then it's good if you can have after that some time where you are coming back and relaxing and letting the energy that is still stuck in your, in, in your system, that you let it evaporate again that you don't keep filling up and filling up and filling up, otherwise it's becoming too much for you. You don't have to start to be afraid of connecting with them because then you cannot really do your job. <laughs> then you become cynical and you just become a prescriber like many. <laughs> but uh, while you connect, you can learn that you connect with that immovable aspect in you and then relax in that and then the energy the negative destructive energy that comes in doesn't have so much capacity to hook onto a, something, but just this passing through. As I said before, you become more and more transparent. Hmm. What I didn't get that uh, I become it's more transparent. That the the energies are just going through instead of somehow hooking into your system and stuck in, uh, being stuck there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Now that makes sense. Maybe it was just hard to con stay connected somehow to myself, I felt. When I realized that <laughs> the reaction maybe I expected when I asked um, if she feels regret mm -hmm. and I, I, I realized, wow, no, she's far away from that. She's not... Mm -hmm. um, was a moment I think maybe when I lost something or like like I was surprised or I yeah it's it's something I didn't expect in that moment and then I maybe I lost some I lost some of the connection I usually can keep mm -hmm. of course that may happen time and again that the, the situation somehow shakes you out of it but then if you remember as long as you don't remember, you can't do anything. But the moment you remember, you become aware. Then first job is to bring the attention back as good as you can. <laughs> yeah. If you look what people are capable of doing and how they are functioning, then sometimes it may shock us. And then we get a bit uh, unbalanced for a moment, but then the first is to bring it back and accept, okay, this is the situation. People are disconnected from their natural state. That's why they can act like this. 
I mean, evil people are doing evil actions because they are totally disconnected from their natural state, from their true nature. And some people, they want that and they create such a wall on purpose. There is, there is hardly anything good in them that uh, is manifesting. It's still there underneath everything, but uh, other people, they are just in balance, like most probably that girl is, that uh, she's not having uh, an intent not to connect with the light, but simply because of her imbalance that sometimes she may open up so strongly to the dark side that it simply overwhelms her. And then, yeah, uh, there may be actions and reactions and feelings that may shock, but then uh, try not to be judgmental and see, uh, okay, that's how it is. But what is important in that moment that you connect? <laughs> mm. And in that way, you are helping yourself and you are helping also your patient. Yeah, already when I hear you talking or listen to you, I feel that I get a more compassionate or feeling somehow. Um, maybe because I connect again with uh, myself and it helps me. It, maybe it's true. It, it was like a bit judgmental or out of the fear that also started to yeah, work uh, inside of me. I felt also at one point a kind of a fear that something would happen again and I couldn't help her or something like this, you know, and um, maybe because I had the reaction, I was like, can I work with her still, you know, like running away or um, so, but it helps me to listen to you that, um, yeah, I come back to this more, how can I say, yeah, light um, feeling of compassion also. And okay, yeah, she she's just the best disbalanced girl and um, I can help her more if I stay and stay connected than saying, okay, I cannot work with you because it would just close the door. Yes. And make her more desperate. Yeah. And the more firmly you are rooted in that, the less that feeling comes, uh, we need to judge and uh, create a distance and create the wall. But then we can see, okay, there is just that uh, miss, that unbalance and that disconnection. And somehow uh, when you see it and you stop blaming, then you see simply the situation and you do what you can. And then you said, maybe I was afraid I'm not capable of helping her. You can do what you can, and then whether finally it's helping her to work her way out of it or not, that doesn't lay in your hands. It has also to come from her. You can help her, you can give the pointers, you can support, but then ultimately everybody has to make the decision for themselves. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Hario. Hario, Hario. Is there anybody else who would like to come? You're welcome. So I will come again. Yes, Leora. Everybody is really quiet. Also in connection to what Mariam shared and what I shared before about criticism, like the difference between criticism and the um, um knowing that okay this no or him not or she not um criticism usually comes with stories then i can tell you now for five minutes about my neighbor things in a like the criticism telling like giving criticism about her stories she did so and this is not something you do and it's all like blah blah stories yeah so you can spare us the five minutes <laughs> yeah of course yeah i will so uh no she's okay she's okay just um 
but it's these uh, situations when um, we realize that we or I shouldn't or don't want to be too close to so and so person. Um, and it doesn't even matter why. I mean, they talk rubbish or if, if they lie, I don't know what, whatever. So for me, it's something new because I was, I used to be involved with myself in the criticism with the person and get all mixed up. I would have a relationship with them, but then I would criticize and then I say, like, you know what I mean. But now I'm more, more clear with myself about, like we have in Hebrew an expression, not from your honey, not from your sting. Like, should be careful with this person. Not the, not get too close. So that's a whole shift for me in in life to like like actually like what I did with this uh, person from Norway, um, and also with people that I do want to keep the connection somehow with my sister, where it's really really complicated, and we had a long period with no communication. where in spite of all the criticism or negative, not even negative, like she's impossible in a way. <laughs> what can I say? I'm sorry. She's diff yeah, difficult. But I do want to keep relationships with her. So I have to do it really wisely. Right. And uh, you said, I don't have to be too close. So you can choose, you can feel. Now, if your sister, you feel it's somehow on the program that you keep the touch, that you keep the connection. But that doesn't mean you have to keep contact or be close to impossible people all the time. If, if you don't feel like connecting and keep your distance and it uh, goes smoothly, then uh, that's fine. You, it still may... Sometimes you meet and then you okay, you do what you can, but uh, it's not that you have to think now, you have to keep contact with everybody, even if somehow there is a total disharmony. Of course, in Mariam's case, then uh, it's a bit different. It's a professional, yeah. si professional situation. And so it's better not to run away, but you can very well choose what you feel and you choose with you you choose with your sister okay that's on the program in in spite of its having challenges all the time but then you can choose with other people where you don't feel it need to be on the program that you rather uh, go a bit around them <laughs> nothing wrong with them that Yeah. But yes, uh, not keeping the mind full of judgmentality all the time. That is only hurting yeah, ourselves. Yeah, exactly. That's sort of a negativity that, that the nervous system holds uh, as uh, some kind of poison, really. Right. I mean, we are wasting our own energy for, for something completely useless. That beautiful energy that can be... Yeah experienced in the present and expressed in a beautiful creative way gets wasted then there it's like a drain when we keep on uh, turning church mentality around in our head it doesn't help you it doesn't help them it simply brings more negativity in the world yeah it's a habit <laughs> well the whole world does that all the time so we have to make a conscious effort to see it and then to learn to detach and not to get sucked into that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Right. That doesn't mean we have to try to artificially do the opposite and say, no, everything is so wonderful and beautiful what they are doing. No. Uh, no artificial nonsense. Simply, okay, uh, you can see they are functioning like this and you can accept that they are like this and we don't know all the details why they have to become the way they are and function like that. 
but uh, obviously it's a problem for them with connecting with that their own naturalness and so it's more a matter of, of having compassion with them than uh, being judgmental about them <laughs> Yeah, compassion um, is easy like that because if something in me lets go, then compassion is natural. But yes. it's different compassion that that the what, again in vipassana they teach the um, um, you know for forty five minutes you sit and you recite the sentences. May I be so? May I? He he will be so. Uh, to practice um, compassion and uh, mudita and all that. Yeah. And uh, I did it. I hated it, but I did it. But it's different when uh, something in me lets go and the nervous system somehow is more organized and also connected to the whole body and to, to the brain, somehow to the heart then there is uh, more space and uh, then compassion is actually this space it's uh, empty right. it comes yeah. it's not something that you have to practice it comes naturally right yeah but you have to pra i mean i have practiced but since Wesa, i've been with you it's different practice but still yeah Okay. I'm, I'm not saying anything against all those practices that can no, no. help us yeah. and open up to that, but then the real compassion simply spontaneously springs up. Huh? Yeah, yeah. When uh, yeah, when there is a deep letting go of habits and of yeah. And one main thing that is preventing that is just holding on to judgmentality. To, uh, standing into judgment over the, what people are doing, what people are saying, how they are acting, how they are reacting, uh, what their mental state is, and all that. That judgmentality prevents us from the natural compassion to manifest. Yeah, but I, I, I think it's a sort of protection that uh, many of us develop um, as we are afraid of, of letting go and just like be, you know, sort of open and aware without being hurt. So uh, judgmentality uh, and criticism are like way, our ways, I think so, maybe to protect ourselves. Yeah, no, not yeah. to protect yourself, but to protect yourself image. <laughs> okay, my, yeah. okay, okay. It's a yeah. protection of not what you are, but what you would like to appear to be. And then that self-image needs protection. <laughs> but uh, then we become aware, when we become more conscious, that the self-image is just a projection and you yourself don't need that protection. It's only what we imagine needs protection. Then we try to hold that self-image together. And there we have all these kind of reactions that we need to be judgmental and create all those walls, those barriers to, to keep that bubble alive. But it's a bubble that is not worth to keep alive so much. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's heartbreak. I mean, yeah, touches my heart. Thank you. All right. <laughs> then we leave it at that. Adios. Yeah, yeah. Adios. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else who would like to come? You're welcome. Hello, Anita. Hello. I'm not sure how to put the question. Let's try. Mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> I try. Uh, but when you talk today again about this coming back into my center, becoming aware, being consciously conscious, um, I suddenly Oh, was wondering, um, because then you say also, yeah, and sometimes you cannot do anything if you're not aware, you're not aware. And then 
the question is something like, uh, what part in me or, or what, what is it? Or is it the one who remembers or, or the thing or the, I don't know, what is it that remembers? Is it, is it a part from the one who is the real I, kind of, you know, from the essence? Mm. Or is it just, um, is the question wrong? Because it's, it's more that there's everything else that prevents me from remembering that is, yeah. So this is the kind of non-question. Right. <laughs> It's a call from yourself, the remembrance. But then there is the self and there is the role that we are playing and somehow there has, hap uh, there has grown an identification with that role. And that role has certain characteristics and certain habits and the identification is there, but then there comes out of yourself that call, let go. It's, you are not that role. But then still the habit pulls the attention again and again in the little circle of the role. But that the memory comes is a call from the self, but then in our conscious experience where that identification is alive, that me, I am a person, then there, that's part of the game. There is that possibility then either to open up on one side or to close, to open up to that source, to that call from the self, or then to push it aside and insist on the old reactions. <coughs> and there's no other way to go about it, but as good as we can, Whenever you remember, consequently at that moment, just bring the attention home and relax in it. And if we do that, then that fabric of that identified identification of that identification with the role starts to change. That the the quality of the role starts to change and from as it is purifying, it becomes easier and easier of becoming aware of that call from the self. So, hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, I, as a manifestation, as a person, I can consciously contribute to decide again and again, I want to connect with truth. I want to connect with reality. I want to go home. Or I can insist, no, no, I, I want my personal right and to continue the same thing as I'm doing all the time. <laughs> that possibility is there. Still, still, it seems for me that there is this, how you say this, I don't know the English word, uh, but there's grace which calls, or it's... Yes. Right. Grace calls, but grace in a way is all the time there. Sometimes it's manifesting strong. It comes more intensely, but it's there all the time. And with the grace, we can open up to the grace or we can close ourselves. That much uh, is making a difference. Yeah, but this is also not my choice. Or I mean, if, if because of my karma and everything, I was involved in and what with what I grew up and so on. I, I can't consciously decide. I mean, I can when I am. Um, I hear the call. I think maybe the, that's when I can make the conscious um, decision. I want to. I want to hear you more often, or something like that. Right. Or, right. That's what I mean by telling when you remember. 
then you can do something about it. As long as we don't remember then what you are describing, then it's just those mechanisms that functioning, those conditionings that have come from all kinds of directions that are uh, pushing our actions and reactions. But when the memory comes, then at that moment, it's the call from the self and there, we do have the possibility to really consciously open up to that or rather turn turn away from it. You mean this is a conscious choice? Right. That is the part, that is the game of this world. That is why the whole story does make sense that we are here. Otherwise, if it was simply a mechanical thing that has to unroll itself, it would be somehow totally senseless, but it is not. There is there is that, that little aspect of creativity and freedom in the consciousness manifest that there is from moment to moment the possibility to open up to the source, to the truth, or rather to close ourselves to that. And the more you are exercising it, the more naturally that call will come and you will hear it and open to that. <clears throat> the force of the conditioning may overwhelm us time and again, even when we are conscious. But the very attempt of opening in the right direction is doing something. And if we do that, again and again that becomes stronger and is slowly getting stronger than the power of all the conditioning that is there so there is no need for um hypnosis to reprogram the subconscious uh, mm. for whatever <coughs> There's, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And if somebody feels attracted to do this kind of thing, it's not, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's still finally coming from moment to moment. Uh, it's coming to you. It's you who have to make the step. And it's not somebody who can hypnotize you to do so. <laughs> Or there you can learn self-hypnotism. Uh, basically, it's simply consciously rearranging a bit the conditioning. So because the hypnotism is in full swing now all the time when we are functioning without being conscious, then everybody is totally hypnotized in playing their role and identifying with it and just acting out of all the push and pull that come with that conditioning. That is the big hypnotism. And learning to open up to the source is basically learning to dehypnotize ourselves. If somebody chooses to get closer to that, by uh, doing this conscious self-hypnotism into the positive direction, that may help. But eventually, it's not that we have to hypnotize ourselves to uh, be. We have to get rid of all the hypnotisms that we are something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just came to this idea because I have a friend, she's doing hypnosis, hypnosis to mm. bring people to be um, successful in business and things like that. Ah, right. Uh, for that, not for self-realization, but uh, to, yeah. Yeah, to, but to, to yeah. be more successful in material life. Right, right. Um, right. Which has its, its place also, I mean, because if people just suffer because their subconscious is always making just problems uh, yes. then why not why not but, yes but i for myself uh, i uh, i prefer to do the yoga nidra mm. because this is like relaxation and then i put some sankalpa that you know this sentence right, right. i remember myself or 
whatever. I prefer this. Yes. It's uh, similar to, because the, the brain waves go slow and it's a kind of very relaxed state. Yeah? Yes, yes. Right, right. I'm, uh, okay. Uh, what you described, what your friend does, is just on another level, on the practical level, uh, using that hypnotism, that uh, rearranging the subconscious, that people don't always sabotage their own efforts to, to be successful. Fine. If, uh, if she wants to do that and people come and are helped, fine. But what we are trying to do is go beyond that, uh, to come back to the source, not simply arrange our external situation better. <laughs> Oh, right. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Adio. 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 I think before Vikas tried to come in, when Anita came in. Yes, there you are. Hello, Vikas. Hello, Anna. Hello. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, my question is, uh, I've been doing this uh, Krishna Upasana where uh, I do like chanting for 35, 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, but uh, lately, uh, but my old habits, uh, uh, they don't go. So, I came across something called as uh, Bhairav Upasana uh, where Kal Bhairav is uh, I, I was told that uh, he is a uh, one uh, deity who is very closer to our realms and uh, he can, if you do his upasana, he uh, guides you and uh, uh, helps you. So, do you have any, uh, can you tell me something about it? Is it, should I, uh, should I do that or I should continue with my Krishna upasana? Also, I wanted your phone number because I wanted to do my, uh, wanted some guidance from you on my breathing exercise. Hmm. That we can write. Uh, are you on uh, Facebook? No, 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 no. no. Okay. I can write you my phone number. <laughs> um, to your question, I don't have experience with the Tupasana that you are describing. So I cannot tell you from my own experience. But what I can tell you is, is it now simply a calculation in your mind that maybe you are getting more effect if you do that? Or is it really coming from your heart? Look, have a good, honest look at yourself. And then, you can do what you feel is right for you. And if you feel to continue with your Krishna Upasana, then by all means, continue that Krishna Upasana and not think because you have heard and read that the other is more efficient for certain things that you should change to that. If your heart tells you, Yes, it's time to do so, to do that change, or to do both, I, go, I don't know. Fine, but if it's simply a calculation, then there is something missing, and I think you are better informed to continue to do that upasana that, you, that comes from your heart. Right, right. Right. I'll do that. Thank you, Hari Mario, I'll write you a an, an message at the end with the number. Right. Right. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to come in? You're welcome. And let me say something more to what we just discussed with Vikas. <clears throat> when we are doing spiritual practices, 
especially when we're starting something, often there is the feeling, oh, yes, there is something there. There is a good effect. Because grosser aspects immediately get affected and we can feel, right, there is something very good going on. But then when we proceed, sometimes, most of the time, for practitioners, that feeling starts to disappear. We practice, we practice, and somehow it feels, hmm, doesn't really have much effect. And then we always can read and hear from all directions wonderful things, wonderful practices, and people are gushing with telling us how much effect they are experiencing. And then one is always tempted, oh, maybe I should do something else. It would maybe have a better effect. But if we do that something else, with the first enthusiasm, it may feel again, oh, my God, yes, something is happening. Something is really going on. But if we go on with that same practice, the same thing will happen again. That somehow the feeling comes in. I keep on practicing, keep on doing, and not much is happening. But actually, still something is happening. So we have to learn to be very careful and really have a good look at ourselves. Does it really come from deep down when we want to change our practice? Does it really come from my heart? Do I feel in my heart, yes, this is the right thing to do? Or is it simply because we are getting convinced in our mind, maybe we could be more successful and more efficient and somehow squeeze something more out of it if we change? It's not meant that uh, if we have chosen something that we need to continue with that same thing for the rest of our life. But basically, it's good to have a basic direction and build up on that. And then if a new aspect comes in, we can consider it, we can check it, and maybe we can integrate it in our practice that we are already doing. But nothing simply because it said somewhere, written somewhere, some other people talk like this, that uh, something else is much more efficient. That we always then, okay, we do that. And then after some time it feels it doesn't, uh, it, there is not more much effect. And then, okay, we do that. Like that, we never really go through that phase where the practice seems to be not more so efficient, but actually it's also a defense mechanism of the personality that doesn't want to give up. That on one hand, we are longing for freedom. On the other hand, the habit of feeling, thinking, acting, reacting, as a person is strong and doesn't want to give up on something that really attacks that personality is a sustained practice. <laughs> and so it's also from that part that that feeling comes that uh, oh, maybe it's not a good practice, maybe it's not efficient enough, maybe I should do something else. But then with that something else, when it's starting to get really deeper, then the may, same feeling may come back again from the personality. Oh, it's not good. It's not good because somehow there is a defense mechanism of the old habit that doesn't want to let go. As I said, we are not necessarily condemned to continue the same thing on and on and on and on. But before we change, it's good to really introspect and see and feel and be honest. Where does it come from? 
I have read something and it has touched me so deeply and there is such a resonance. And if I feel that, yes, and it really comes from your heart, then it's a time to make a step and change something. But if it's simply that calculating mind and thinks, so oh, maybe I can get out more of it, but it's not something that naturally would come from you, then better don't go for that. Because then we can keep on changing and doing different things all the time. It's in the long run not useless, but maybe if we would stay with something longer persistently, it would help us more to break through those barriers that the personality creates to protect itself from being absorbed into the self. <clears throat> All right. So I'm asking you again, my friends, is there anybody else who would like to come in? You're welcome. Hello, Werner. Hello, Dial. Um, I asked you last time about meditation on small spot and meditation on total body. Mm -hmm. And still, I would like to clarify. Yeah. Because when I focus on small spot, I go deeper into subtle reality of the body, at least. I can feel vibrations, feel this spot in very small details. And once when I went to kind of another space, different space, not normal state. Mm. But when I uh, try to observe all the body, part by part, or working in total body, whatever I feel, uh, it's more superficial. But uh, you was answering that it's uh, similar, uh, doesn't matter what I'm doing. Mm. But still there is different. For example, you said um, uh, when there is negative emotions, we can feel these emotions in the body, sensations and the energy around the body, and they will <coughs> dissolve slowly. Yeah. Uh, but when yeah. we work in on small spot, um, that means we will not work in this these emotions, right? You're still working if you don't uh, suppress them. I mean, if you are working on that working on that small spot and the negative emotion arises and you can simply drop it, then you can sim then simply drop it and continue with your concentration. But if it's insisting, then you can accept, okay, I have to devote some time to that and deal with that. And when you can let it go, you just come back to your concentration. But okay. since you basically feel now, at least in this period, uh, you are more drawn to that small spot aspect meditation than more going throughout the body, then by all means do that. And if emotions come up, you see them, you can just let them go, let them go. Don't think you have to go through the whole process all the time. But if something comes insistent and anyhow disturbs you in your meditation, there you can surrender to the fact, okay, I need to devote some time to that. And let it evaporate and once you are capable you come back to your concentration okay i will try and another thing i want to ask you about similar stuff when you said if i say i can feel this i how it's reflected in my senses 
Uh, basically, I feel body sensations. I feel myself in the chest or in the head or in the belly. So uh, this eye, the presence of eye, I feel through the body sensations. So and how this connected with working with a small spot? Is it so different approach or there is kind of different? It's, it's a slightly different aspect of the same approach yeah. but uh, if if you feel that uh, you are benefited by just focusing on that small spot and concentrate then uh, you simply continue with that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. okay Jeremy. i will uh, i have to practice more and more and only this will give me understanding Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hurry on. I wish you the best with it. Hurry on. <laughs> Hurry on. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who would like to talk? There is not a right way or a wrong way to practice. And of course, established schools, often they have their very strict way of telling, first you do that, then you do that, then you do that, then you do that, and this is the right way. This is just a way. And if it corresponds to somebody, then following faithfully all those instructions, all those steps is, is fine. But whatever helps us to really connect with that sense of presence. And often I said, if you just say, I, Immediately, you are touching that sense of presence. But, of course, somebody who concentrates in the present is also touching that sense of presence. We can also combine it, but we can also just do one aspect and not do the other. Everybody has to find their own way. And in that sense, I said before, we have our basic approach, and then as the time passes, sometimes it changes a little. We are adapting new aspects, integrate them. Maybe we let go of all the aspects that were included. That is perfectly fine. But it's not that we have to have always a doubt, am I doing the writing or am I doing my practice? wrong and too often one can have the feeling that one is wrong if one is uh, just looking at what the particular tradition is saying because their tradition may pu put it very strictly chuck 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 but whatever works whatever helps us to connect, to be in the present, to be conscious of the timelessness of the now. Whatever helps us is the right way. And people are different and we may go on a very strict traditional way and then at a certain time become aware, okay, now it's time to loosen up the strictness of that and I can develop my own flavor because it's easier for me and becoming more natural. So we need not be afraid of doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Sometimes when I discovered in my sadhana, discovered, discovered a new aspect 
and integrated that and felt, oh, it's very efficient. And I thought, why have I not done that before? If I had done that before all the time, maybe I would be far ahead. I would be much deeper. No. At that time, when it comes, it was right. And it helped to do just that, to more powerfully connect with that sense of presence, with that essence, with that base that is always there. We can develop that self-confidence and just have a good look and see how we are estranging from that and how we can bring the attention back and that which comes naturally and easiest, that is the best way to go about it. And then we may combine it with other aspects and then that works perfectly well or we may also not combine it and keep it in another simplicity. Just keep going on and on. <laughs> the essence is the same. The minds are different. And as the minds are different, there are differences of ways that we, strategies that we can use to connect with the essence. And so it is, there is nothing wrong with that. That's the beauty of it also. <laughs> that each one's pub, each one's story becomes something unique and beautiful. What we are looking for, what we need to do, is basically so simple. What is not simple is to confront all the barriers that come out of the subconscious and then in spite of it popping up again and again and pulling us away all the time and again, in spite of that to continue. <laughs> that needs courage, that needs perseverance and patience but what we need to do is basically simple and so if we choose something and that works then it's fine and we should not sabotage, sabotage ourselves all the time thinking maybe I should do it a bit different or should add something or something is not wrong because basically the teaching is like this or like that. If it works, go about it. And then if a period comes where it's not so easy, then we just continue. We know it works, but somehow we may have to go through a period where there is more bubbling up from the subconscious, where there is somehow more difficult influences from the outside, whatever that is, wherever the obstacles come from, then if we keep going, then that we are going through that again, and there we become aware, yes, it is very efficient. Once you are rooted, once you are really living from that perspective, you don't have to use the tool anymore. And yet, many Mahatmas, they still will practice their tool because it's simply one way to intensify that sense of presence, even if they are rooted, even if they are not losing it. Doing the same practice in spite of that will harness a lot of energy which is beneficial for them and which is also beneficial for the whole world. All right. Let me finish the satsang with this for today. I wish you all well.
हरिओम हरिओम हरिओम